weeks ago. And we had Booyah coming out on top thanks to, as they put it, 200 years of game design experience. <laughs> <laughs> coming out Pulling in. out the, uh, the Riot Games uh, bag of tricks. Yeah. yeah, that good old meme. So... Uh, but they said it was a super close game. They have a lot of respect for this team going on in. Uh, and they're both really excited for this rematch. And honestly, after seeing the first two games, I don't know how you can't be excited for these matchups uh, if you're the casters, if you're the viewers, because we saw a really controlled win coming on out from Booyah in game one. And then Glacier Rising Phoenix just taking it to uh, the Brawl Club in game two with a very fast 22-minute victory. Uh, both teams looked in pretty good form. We're going to have to see what happens here as they go up against each other. Yep. And so because it is a best of one, both teams have to put their absolute best on the line. And you can already see that they're picking out some of those champions that were played in tonight's games just to force these players onto some secondary champions. The Orn, the Leona, the Syndra taken away target bans between both teams. Now, surprisingly, we uh, haven't seen any Aphelios played whatsoever yet. Uh, maybe that's because this is the light testing grounds, and so he's a bit of a more complex champion, and players yeah, aren't too. as it warmed up to it. That was the other thing, is that he has been nerfed a little bit, little bit, little bit, and then a bit of a nerf bat in this last patch update. So Yeah, the, the lethality <laughs> nerf versus the percent armor scaling pen hurt him a lot. Uh, the percent pen made him just like you didn't even have to build the armor shred item later And so you could just go full crit and with the BT and still get the percent shred against tanks um, As if he wasn't disgusting enough already um, But that said as you're talking about the rest of picks and bans We do have some of those tools being taken away We saw the Orn of the Leona be played to great success in that last game from Glacial Rising Phoenix Booyah didn't want to see that again taking those away some of the respect bans being given over uh, as well as, oh boy, uh, it, we're going to get aggressive real fast as that is a Yasuo coming on in for Booyah. Going to have to see where that one goes as he can be played in three different positions. And he was banned against them by Toon Squad. So Pick obviously Dragus. one of their members oh, yeah. really enjoys playing this Yasuo. And now when they grab the Nautilus as well, you know that with the Yasuo, you're going to start to pile on as many knockups as possible. And Nautilus is one of the best and easiest because you press R and someone's going to get knocked up maybe more than just that one person. So Yasuo going to enjoy oh, the last breath onto multiple members. But Morgana and Kaisa paired up for that boss bottom lane the purple duo and very very nice especially when kaisa engages with a killer instinct with the black shield on to avoid any of that crowd control trying to cc her after diving into the back line yeah and you know these teams are familiar with each other given how fast this pick band's going morgana being that soft counter into nautilus coming on through to give kaisa some protection that said they are going to pick up their ad carry giving away that the yasuo is going to be in a solo lane uh so the misfortune going to be locked in as uh, I'd say that Melvix going 15-3 and three in Game 1, uh, that, that warrants a pretty nice re-pick up there uh, for the bot laner of Booyah, as going to find himself piloting that misfortune once again. Yeah, it's one of those champions that just always has so, so, so much power and damage. You can see more, more respect bands coming bands through. The Graves, the Gragas, the, both of these champions play. The Lee Sin as well. Uh, they, well, actually, I think Lee Sin... Might have been played by Toon Squad in game number one. Yeah, it was. It was yeah. So maybe they just. I, I, Jarvin's up. Jarvin's by far the best jungler up with so many jungle bands going through. That said, we are going to have in a, so a lot of early aggression coming on the side of Booyah. It also opens up them taking another AD solo laner, given the fact that Elise does have AP coming out of the jungle. Going to have to see how Glacial Rising answers. I feel like Glacial Rising needs to take a little bit of stall power here. Going up against the Elise, you already have the Morgana to really negate the Elise's impact later in the game. Uh, that said, they're not going to listen, and looks like they're going to take the Camille, which puts the Mordekaiser in the mid lane. Yep, it's uh, one of those things that when they're Ooh, banning wait, could the... could be Camille jungle. Yeah, the... the... Oh, wait, yeah, yeah. Oh, Silas May is being Silas hovered. jungle, maybe, too? There's a lot we'll, we'll of mobility on these champions. Camille, yeah. Silas, Mordekaiser. Well, yeah, we'll have to see... Uh, fully expect Mordekaiser to go in that top lane. Uh, the Camille throws it off. I, I love Mordekaiser as a top lane pick because he's such a great weak side top laner. You can just leave him up there on an island once he hits six. You can't really gank him. And he is going to be in the top lane as that is a last minute corky lock-in 
Uh, putting the Camille in the jungle, unless it's something wacky, we could see Mordekaiser jungle, I guess. Uh, not exactly expecting that, even though it is a possibility. Uh, and yeah, Corky, really safe blind pick of the midnight and scales really nicely. It has the Morgana shield as well. Uh, gonna have to see how Booyah rounds this out. If they have a top laner or a mid laner to select, oh boy. Yep, damage, damage, damage. Here's some more snowball damage. No knockup. Uh, it's actually the only knockup on the team for Booyah is that Nautilus, but that might be Jerry, enough. If you react quickly, it, it is one. Uh, Wait, apprehend. Apprehend? Oh, I think you are yeah. right. Yeah, if you react quickly, it is a knockup. Uh, and very I'm curious to see what they end up throwing into that Darius. Uh, usually, I'm not a huge fan of Darius coming on in. He is kind of that solo queue pub stomper, uh, which is funny because if you've been playing TFT lately and the Dunk Squad, he's also a pub stomper in there. Uh, but he has really good matchups into the Camille and the Mordekaiser. Mordekaiser not being mobile. Darius wants to brawl. Uh, does really good. He's really easily able to stack up his bleed against both those champions and against Camille. You can also pull Camille out of her hook shot. So I kind of like that counter pick coming in at the end. I feel like it's a decent game for him. And if he gets going in that lane phase with the help of an, an Elise, he could get out of control in the top lane. Very different pick though coming in for Wimbles from that unkillable Malachi uh, after game one. Right. And so. The reason that I love this Camille is that she's incredibly aggressive when you choose a target to jump in, but most importantly, exceptional at split pushing. And when you have a Yasuo on the enemy team, you know that he's going to be wanting to split push. And so even if this Camille is in the jungle throughout that early game, once the laning phase is starting to end, she can transition into being a side laner to match this Yasuo or match this Darius. And she can get out if she needs to with those wall hook shots. She can engage if the, um, the rest of her team is collapsing and looking for a fight. She can quickly rotate between lanes because she has such incredible mobility. All of those things are incredibly nice. But I think the biggest factor is that she can do a really good job of pressuring Elise because when you use the Hextech ultimatum on the Elise, even if she repels, she has to come back down inside of that square. So there's no opportunity to sneak over walls or sneak and in, uh, jump into the Baron or Dragon Pit or any of those sorts of things. So being by being able to pin down certain uh, champions and have that target selection of Yasuo, you don't get to jump away and escape this fight. Elise, you don't get to repel and escape this fight. You're going to get locked down is one of the really powerful things that I like about the Camille. Yeah, but when I see Camille, the thing that Camille screams out to me is level 2 aggression. Mm -hmm. That level 2 gank from Camille is so deadly coming out from her, but I don't really see where she's gonna go. You know, I, I guess you can pressure the uh, Yasuo, but Corky doesn't really have that gank setup. Could pressure the Darius, but once again, the gank setup isn't really there, and also the Morgana. Uh, I know the jungle pool was really clamped, but I would have loved to see a Jarvan coming out. Uh, I feel like Jarvan is, hands down, the best jungler left on the table. And I understand why Booyah didn't elect to go Jarvan, because they wanted to opt for the Darius in the top lane for that counter pick, and they needed AP damage. But I think the Jarvan would have been such a great answer uh, to what uh, Booyah was laying down with that level two, or that flexibility coming out from early aggression, but also some scaling, giving Corky a little bit of peel with that Cataclysm, or just getting on the misfortune if they really want to pressure her with a Morgana shield. That's a Camille does very similar things, but she has a lot of trouble having a healthy clear. So it's really up to her finding early land ganks uh, for this pick to be extremely effective, which is going to be exciting because over on the side of Booyah, Elise wants to do the same thing. Once she gets level three, she is such a deadly jungler. Mm -hmm. So look out for Greasy God. Uh, to see if he A goes for that level 2 cheese or B ends up hitting that level 3 and where they end up looking to gank. And I fully expect for them to target that Mordekaiser before he hits 6 to get this Darius rolling. Well, and if you can think all the way back to game number 1, Greasy God was on the Gragas and constantly matching Toon Squad's jungler gank for gank for gank and most often coming out with a little bit of an edge or a kill or a flash burned because of the response time. And so the ability to read where the enemy team jumps jungler is huge, but the big factor there was that Toon Squad's jungler, the Lee Sin, was mostly looking for lane ganks. He wasn't really doing a lot of invading, stealing away buffs, and looking to fight the enemy jungler one-on-one. -on -one. He was mostly looking to pressure into that mid or top lane and trying to get his laners ahead. So this time around, uh, Dynamite Larry could look for those lane ganks, 
could also potentially just go to kill Elise. It's one of those things of, hey, I struggle to farm yeah. my jungle, so I'll farm the enemy team's jungler instead, and then get my gold off of that before looking for those lanes. But the Elise also has incredible power when it comes to diving turrets in the early game, and so I'd like to see Elise focus a little bit of pressure on that bottom side because the crowd control from the cocoon paired with the nautilus dredge line paired with his passive root paired with misfortune's damage all of those things can come together to make a really really powerful bottom lane especially against squishier members like the kaisa and morgana but yeah i just want to watch greasy gods jungling this game is he's able to re dynamite larry as well as he was uh from toon squad's jungler in game number one it's going to be tough. It felt like that first game. I even said it during the cast that he had wall hacks on, just following uh, the Lee Sin, answering him at every single turn. If he's able to do that again, I I want to know what kind of like what did he put in his milk for breakfast when he had that cereal because it was something like just reading like a pro like out of a book. It was insane. And yeah, I like the fact that you mentioned bot lane. Right, there are two uh, two. Hard CCs coming in between the Nautilus and the Elise. There's only one black shield, so I'm not too good at math, but that does say that one target might be open uh, to knock out. Looking to see what Greasy God ends up doing, as it's really going to be on both these early game junglers to set the tempo early, because uh, both teams are looking to snowball, especially Booya. Having that Darius, having that Yasuo, uh, not going to scale as hard as the double AD carry comp coming out from Glacial Rising. So. I feel like Glacial Rising went full on aggression in that first game, despite taking the later game scaling comp. They have it again. Booyah did a really nice job of playing the game out slow and controlled game one with the late game comp. Gonna have to see how these teams end up crashing and interacting with each other in the early game, because according to Booyah, they got beat really bad in the early game uh, when they t went toe-to-toe -to -toe in the finals a couple weeks ago, but they are able to turn around off the back of Malvex. Gonna have to see if that script plays itself out again as we dive into this game. Yeah, and if I had to pick a team that I wanted to win personally, I would want to see Glacier Rising Phoenix be a victor in this uh, overall event as a whole. And I think that they've comped themselves a very fun, very aggressive, very damage heavy team. But as you're talking about that slow controlled movement from uh, Booyah Armada is one that they can do this game as well because they've got the Nautilus, they've got that uh, Darius for bringing a lot of damage into those team fights, and so they have a composition that can definitely win them this first place if they're able to play around this Elise correctly. So a lot of attention going to have to be on these junglers and where they go, but simply uh, pick and ban wise, who do you think won the draft? We'll have to see. That's a dangerous game you're playing there, Jake. Picking favorites. You don't want to be TSM Jat here at Excellence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. It's a little bit of fun. This is oh, finals. Is kind of Best of I one. Guess I'll, I'll side with Booyah then. We'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to switch it up a little bit. All right. Um, let's see. It looks like a bug splat as we do dive into an early pause. Give just a little bit more time to talk about the draft as you brought up. It, it's, it's really interesting because we have a lot of picks coming in that are a little bit different. Um... And with the draft, you know, I feel like both teams have pretty clear win conditions, right? You have uh, Mordekaiser loves to play weak side. You have a very aggressive jungler in Camille. It's going to be up to Camille to get this Corky, get this Kaisa up and off the ground running. And I really think it's up to, uh, are, is Greasy God going to be able to punish this Mordekaiser before he hits six? Because if um, Booyah doesn't get off and rolling, uh, you know, Mordekaiser can opt for some early armor, mitigate a lot of the damage coming out from the primarily physical damage coming out uh, of the side of Booyah. And if that Corky is able to scale up with that Kaisa, they do have a scaling advantage over there. Um, I just think it's really up to, can they get this Darius rolling? Darius can be such a pub stop champ if he gets rolling early, and if he doesn't, he feels pretty useless. So really up to Greasy God of Wimbles, really looking to see what they can do in this early game as we're on the Rift. On to Summoner's Rift for the best of one Glacial Rising Phoenix taking on Booyah Armada for the grudge matchup from oh a couple weeks ago in April. And Glacial Rising hey. Phoenix immediately going to start things off with a five-man stack in the we're top. Rolling. Well, so is Booyah. They're we're both rolling. coming up it, here. We're rolling early, Jake. They, these teams are throwing the gauntlet down. I think they know what each other is doing almost as I talked about the map packs for Greasy got early as both teams are going to get spotted out. I think they're both going to play chicken and back off. No, come on. Go for it. Oh, I was hoping Nautilus would throw a dredge line. Want to Honest start things yeah. off. but Honestly, that's kind of, I'd say that's good uh, 
for both sides, honestly. And as so we have some friendly banner going on there, a uh, little Star Wars uh, quote going on. Well, hello there, uh, General Kenobi. I love as, I love Star Wars, and I love Obi-Wan good Kenobi. Man. Hello there. Valvex. <laughs> uh, might have gotten a little ahead of himself. Actually, doesn't have items. I don't know if he noticed it. So, uh, could base now and get that strut pass to get back to lane. But I, I think he is going to do that as he well, might have left the base a little bit prematurely there, forgetting to grab uh, that Dorn's or Dorn's blade or shield, whatever he decides. Going for that blade. That could hurt um, Booyah because if he's it late would, to lane, it's MF. Go ahead. It's strut. Yeah. Like any other AD carry, that would actually hurt a lot. Because MF has strut, she should be able to get back to this lane and not miss anything. Uh, as looks like we have a little bit of wag issues coming in here for the team. So even more tension and time for this tension to rise as these teams are going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Uh, I was ready for them to just coin flip level one. I, I feel like that's that's the way that I was expecting lightweight to go. Just, you know, game, game five finals or game three finals, just, you know, all in level one. Figure out what happens. Yep, uh, unfortunately, though, we don't get any level 1 Fiesta shenanigans, and one of the things is that I do, while well, as a caster, I want to cast Fiestas, I want to cast crazy fights, I want to cast some fun ridiculousness in games. As a professionalism caster, uh, I want the teams to be doing their best. And teams that flash forward to dive in a 5v5 level 1 is not their best. It is wiser to pull back, play smarter, and pick your fights more carefully than to go for some crazy flash play. And where we want these teams to be excelling and growing, getting better, improving, and eventually making it from light into mid, and mid into heavy, and going up that scaling of ability, uh, the uh, choice by the teams to pull back and play safe is nice to see, even though it would have definitely been more fun to go for a big 5v5 level 1 fight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that said, in the early game, you know, we talked a lot about these junglers and that early aggression, the potential for a level 2 coming out. Looks like both Camille and Elise are going to farm their camps, going for those single target camps, both starting at Hunter's Machete. Um, and I'm going to check MF here. I don't believe MF missed any XP. Uh, so she should be fine in this lane. She did catch all the XP, so... No harm, no foul coming out from that early game. Mishap. Simon Larry uh, has grabbed red buff and immediately run oh, straight into top lane. Wimbles, unfortunately, though, is actually able to at least sniff Nubly's aggression and back up, playing way safer than necessary. Yeah, and, you know, we talked about Camille, what she can do early, and is even going to go walk into the red buff of Carisi God. I like what Dynamite Larry is doing here early, but is going to back out as Darius was rotating down. Nice early attempt coming out. Well played by Wimbles, sniffing that one out. Uh, that was... Uh, did he have a word? He did have a word there. So, very lucky of him. Catches out sight on the Camille. So, backing away. But there's still that uh, opportunity for Dynamite Larry to continue to try to play aggressive. Get this blue buff and then maybe rotate up. Also have that Gromp. But that uh, commitment to say, hey, instead of trying to farm the jungle, which I know I'm going to be slower at, let me go ahead and immediately try to make a level 2 play. I like seeing. We'll see if they can actually find some opportunity to do more than just wander up and say hi. As yeah. bottom lane, slow start for both the jungler, or sorry, oh, the nice. uh, Nautilus finding a route onto Yalma. Merkty getting the black shield, but taking a lot of damage from this fortune. Yeah, well played by the Nautilus playing around with Bush Prio there to actually find uh, auto on the Yama, and they're going to win a nice trade here. Uh, yep. Really well played on the side of Fire Streaks uh, and Malvex, showing once again their bot lane superiority in this game so far early. I love the aggression from the Nautilus, though, to also get some auto attacks down. A lot of supports yeah. just throw out a single skill shot and then back away. They're like, hey, I did my job. It's up to the ADC to deal damage. But nope, fire streaks, whipping that act, uh, the um, anchor around, excuse me, dealing a little bit of extra damage as well. Just really wanting to control that bottom side and win out in those trades. In the meantime, though, both jungles oh going to visit the mid lane at the same time. Greasy God, again, always reading Dynamite Larry. Pots incredibly oh, no. low. One more auto. However, the cocoon is going to land. They might be able to trade on to Skiz. Greasy God's dropping low. The Pell's going to go up, but the minions are enough. They take down Corky. They're looking for Dynamite Larry as well. The flash from the Elise will not save her, but Pots is on the chase. Double buffs onto this Camille. She he can hook exhaust. shot and he then exhaust. go backwards. Exhaust going to come down from that Yasuo. Auto attack not going to come through. And Mordekaiser's rotating from top lane, so Camille should be able to escape. She's actually going to rotate back to mid to grab some farm. 
Dark finding in the bottom lane. Nautilus absorbing the Void Seeker out from the Kaisa. TP coming bot. in from Corky into the bottom lane. They want to keep the fight. The exhaust coming down from the Morgana. They're looking for Malvex, trying to finish off the misfortune. Ooh. Dark finding lands between the minions. Yauma just barely able to go fishing and find the hook that catches the misfortune out. It's a two for one overall between the two teams. Yama hitting the max range dark binding on the misfortune who gets move speed from that strut. What a crazy play coming in from Skiz on the court. He could have easily just TP'd back to mid, gotten some XP, uh, a guaranteed win in the mid lane where, where the Yasuo has to walk back to lane still. Instead, goes for the TP play bot. That's a huge early game play coming out on the side of Glacial Rising Phoenix, and it relieves so much pressure on this Kaisa because. Malvex and Firestreaks were doing such a great job playing out that early lane phase, and that TP just shook the entirety of the lane up. Yeah, I, I love that choice again by these teams to not play like cowards and to not play defensively. They're playing aggressively, and so some really good reading from Skiz in that bottom lane. Able to go in, find that kill, shut the misfortune down a little bit. Unfortunately, no shut down gold specifically for them, but it just evens out the lane for a little bit longer. Misfortune yeah. did recall with that death, I guess, the recall, um, the quick recall, and get a crit cloak as Murkty is still sitting in lane, sitting on 1,200 gold, so... Should have enough for a BF sword once they back. This is so good. We talked about the freezes coming out from Booya in game one against Toon Squad, and they're doing it again. You can see how much pressure they're putting on this Kaisa Morgana because you said it. MF died, but was able to shop and get an item advantage, and they're they forced this lane to back. They're gonna miss another wave of golden experience, and just like that, that TP from Corky, it's an even lane state. They Ooh! able to absorb. Oh, Wimbles, six for six in the top lane. Wimbles just finding the flash cue to drop the Mordekaiser low enough to get the Noxian King guillotine, despite being in the death realm. He's like, look, you invited me to the death realm, but it's going to be your death in this realm that I will bring, as we might see a fight around Drake, Ooh. the first Drake of the game. That Mountain Drake started up by Booyah Armada. Good. TP coming in from Mordekaiser straight into the back of this fight that is really kind of separated, and it seems like Glacial is just happy enough to push the members of Booyah off. Mordekais is going to start it up, though, and Booyah might have decided just to give up on this Drake. Yeah, so Mordekaiser using that TP to secure his team, the Drake. Mountain Drake's going to feel really nice this game. Having those extra resistances against the aggressive team going to help all the members. Uh, that said, Darius is going to walk back and save his TP, so we'll see if he makes a play later in the bot lane, uh, which is where all the action's been going down. We talked about uh, the freeze coming in from Booyah in that bot lane. And that item advantage coming down, Kaisa base now has the item advantage again, and that wave is shoving into Kaisa, so she should be able to get some more golden XP under her belt. But once again, credit going over to Booya. This is something that I haven't seen out of any of the other lightweight teams. Uh, wave management, they're really putting on a great clinic of how you should play the wave in the bot lane and utilize your advantages. Uh, so really good stuff coming out from Malvax and Fire Streaks. I know that they died to that Corky TP, TP gank, but they've honestly played this lane out so well early. Yeah, that's why this Misfortune has a massive CS lead despite having died earlier. And another big factor was that while Corky did jump into that bottom lane, the kill was basically solo between him and the Misfortune, or the Morgana, only picking up an assist. So Kaisa yeah. doesn't even get the bonus gold of an assist or a kill. So she is sitting yeah. far behind this Misfortune in overall gold, overall pressure, and the Camille is in that bottom lane, but I don't know if she's going to be able to pull off a play because of that ward coverage that Booyah has and making sure that bottom lane is safe you can see them immediately backing up as camille was clearing a ward yeah and once again that wave that they were able to shove uh on the side or booyah the wave they shoved in was too big so uh glacial rising phoenix weren't able to do the same to them because they do have the item advantage would be a great time for them to freeze but since the wave was so big that crashed it was too big to hold now the wave bounces back to the mf she's going to pick up all this golden experience has a level lead has a gold lead even though it's not in her pockets at the moment as uh oh boy yeah a uh, little bit of an engage there and they find the elise catching her out corky coming in with the valkyrie from across summoner's rift double kill to dynamite larry and uh glacial very very happy with being able to not only kill the enemy team jungler but the mid laner as well secures themselves the rift herald and definitely a advantage a lead now so we've been praising booyah Armada's bottom lane but their mid and jungler caught out just where they should not have been 
Yeah, an MVP going to that pink ward in the in the top river pixel brush. Elise and Yasuo walked by that brush, didn't check it for the pink ward, and end up getting punished appropriately. Really nice team rotation coming down from Glacial Rising Phoenix. Um, bold play. I like the uh, the idea to play aggressive from the Elise Yasuo coming out, but you got to check that brush for a pink ward. They didn't. They got properly punished. Yep, and the Rift Herald now sitting in the inventory of the Camille. She's on the top side of the map, but could try to go towards any of these lanes to drop it and see if they can pick up some of those plates. Would like to do that early. At least Greasy Elise God coming into the bottom lane. Dredge line is going to drag the Morgana back. She's got the Black Shield, but I think it's a little bit too late. She throws down that ultimate, but those soul shackles will shackle no one. She'll be sent back to the fountain with the death timer. Yeah, really well played on the side of Booyah Armada. Fire Streaks landing that initial hook. Even if Morgana Black Shielded the hook, it would have been down from the damage that comes out from the dredge line for Nautilus. But we have an answer in the top lane. Yeah, Camille coming up there. He goes ahead and drops a Hexic Ultimatum very, very early. Wimble's locked down. Mordekaiser could take him to the death realm, but not going to do it yet. Really wants the help from the Camille to make sure they get that. Flashes in for the Obliterate to finish him off. They can drop the Rift Herald in the top lane. There they go. Clear the wave, grab these plates, and continue to scale Mordekaiser deeper and deeper into this game. Yeah, and you mentioned the Rift Herald earlier that Dynamite Larry had. And I was going to say before that fight broke out in the bot lane, I wanted to see the Rift Herald drop top. It relieves a lot of pressure on this Mordekaiser, gets some gold in his pocket so we can deal with this Darius. And once again, if you shut down this Darius early, it doesn't become a pub stomp, it's at least in trouble. Ooh, there's that dive the Elise, but she's able to flash oh, away out of that mm -hmm. uh, Camille engage. Now Yasuo's found the exhaust onto Nubali. Great flash from Dynamite Larry. The Camille trying to run away, throws out that hook shot. Should have been able to escape. Nubali probably going to go down in a bit of a scuffle. There's that ultimate from Wimbles, finding himself another Noxian guillotine. And that was just Glacial Rising Phoenix way over invested. There was no reason to be walking past the turret after dropping that rare field. Just grab plates and back away. Given the members that were there, uh, it was an appropriate play to dive the Elise, but they didn't calculate the TP still on Wembles as Yasuo, beautiful wind wall. Yep, throws out that, uh... Blast Whisper as well, dropping Yoma low, but I don't think he actually has the damage output no, to be able to do this. However, Malvix does! Here comes the Nautilus as well. Pots will get the finish on to the core key, and so while he may not have been able to do it, when you bring allies to the party, they can help you get the kill. And Pot showing why that Yasuo was banned away from him in game one by Toon Squad. Beautiful wind wall to stop the Morgana binding and then utilizing that dash to dodge out on the big one from Corky. Those two mechanical plays lead to him being able to turn that one around with help from his team. And that's also going to bleed over and give them a free Infernal Drake. So, booyah. They're contesting this lead coming out from Glacial Rising Phoenix, and we have ourselves a close game here as we do find ourselves in another pause. Yep, it's only about a 500 gold lead for Booyah Armada, which doesn't mean that much when you're looking overall between the two teams at the 12-minute mark. What really matters is more about who that gold is on. The Darius in the top lane, 20 CS lead over this Mordekaiser, a kill up as well. You check the total gold that he has, it's almost 1,000 gold up. He is going to hurt massively once these more grouped fights are going to begin. Bot lane, though, the uh, Kaisa still in it. Even CS with this misfortune, only down one kill. So definitely not doing too badly. Only about 300 gold difference between the two of them. And mid lane, not that much to speak of either. So really, the major difference is in the jungle, the Camille being 3-0. and oh, And top lane, the Darius being so much ahead of this Mordekaiser. Yeah, and if you think of these team comps and how you want to function, where would you rather have your gold? I'd much rather have it on the Darius, right? He only functions if he gets ahead and gets to land those dunks on people. So far, he's got two dunks so far this game, and he's working on that Trinity Force. Once he finishes up that item, he's going to hurt this Mordekaiser so much. I fully expect the Black Cleaver to be coming out next as well, as that bleed does uh, apply the stacks of Black Cleaver. He should be able to shred the Mordekaiser like paper after that and dominate the side lane. Which is exactly what Booyah is looking to do. Put Darius in the top lane, put Yasuo in the bot lane, and all of a sudden you have a strong 1-3-1 composition to go into this double AD carry comp that Glacier Rising Phoenix is running. I'd love to talk more about the comps, how they want to 
play, but... Oh. Morgana's already going down. There's a bullet time from Misfortune, then the Elise... No! Camille steals away the dragon! Are you kidding me? Second drag to Glacier Rising Phoenix. Yasuo finding that little knock-up there onto the cork. He will see if he can actually finish him off, and he does indeed. So far, a 1-4-2 in favor of Booyah. The Elise trying to escape. A Greasy God goes down. A flash from the Kaisa to get in range. The chase still through from that Yasuo. Throws at the wind while a little bit too late, though. But they lose the drag despite going two for two in the fight. Dynamite very stealing that drake under the nose of Greasy God. What a nice smite coming on in. As it looks like that was going to go over to the Dynamite Larry says no. And honestly, that really changes the flavor of the game. You know, giving a little bit more AP and AD to that double AD carry composition is going to mean a lot as the game goes on and these items start coming on in. Might help them break this 1-3-1 one, one as things go on because that Corky already scaling up with that Mana Mune. Well, and keep in mind, Nubly actually had the teleport available, so could have joined his team for that fight, but elected to stay top lane and try to defend this turret with about two plates. As Skiz has the package, oh, goes ahead and uses it, knocking the Darius backwards. He flashes the claws, though, trying to get back to his turret, and it looks like he will be able to escape, so good flash from Wimbles to get out. But I wanted to comment very briefly on the fact that Mordekaiser in that top lane, and then think more towards that big middle game 5v5 fights, wants to be using his ultimate to take Darius out of the fight because he won't have those repeat Noxian guillotines on his squishier backline. The problem is, he's losing the fights in the 1v1 versus Darius. So if you get a big 5v5 fight, Mordekaiser may not want to ult the Darius and instead decide to ult something like the Misfortune and keep the bullet time out of the AoE, which leaves Wimbles to potentially tear through his team. So the target selection by these ultimates from that Mordekaiser, from the Yasuo, from the Misfortune are going to be incredibly crucial when it comes to these big 5v5 fights. Yeah, that's a that's a bigger talking point to talk about, about like Mordekaiser as a champion. Um... I always like to use the example of, like, why is Mordekaiser picked into Orn, right? Because it's a relatively even lane matchup, but what happens in the fights? Mordekaiser alts the Orn and takes away all those teamfight tools as uh, Corky might get exploded on here. Yeah, a little Valkyrie over the wall, but that hop skip and the puddle jumper will not be able to get him out. Hextech ultimate used the top lane. Wimbles is going down again. Dynamite Larry with a nice gank up there. And this um, timing from Glacial Rising the top lane have been able to finally pick themselves up a kill, but they lose the mid laner as he is just invading into a jungle that is not his own. And so far, this game has delivered on its promise of the action not stopping. Both these teams trading blow for blow, not backing down from anything as we have Elise looking for more on the top lane. Yeah, I'm not sure what Dynamite Larry was doing in that brush, especially when they half expected Elise to pop over They've the wall anyway. This. But Greasy got immediately throwing out that cocoon, jumping underneath the turret, throws out a little more damage. The W is going to drop into the death realm, goes Noobly, grabbing the Oswald, but that leaves the Camille all alone. Greasy got oh. incredibly low, escaping with just a touch what of health. Gonna... And Noobly, <laughs> oh, what the minion! shot takes him down and it's only an execute onto that in the meantime the bottom lane where got a caught out will go down as well greasy god man making some crazy plays here's yasuo's gotta look to dive this i i'm yeah throws pops, down the yeah, exhaust immediately dashes on and trying to avoid the claw i think he actually autoed the turret on the way in though there's a bullet time in the bottom lane murky no chance to escape fully running away so many members of glacial rising are divers the kaisa with the killer instincts the hook shot from the camille but unfortunately they're starting to fall behind and when you're a diving comp that's falling behind it means you can't really escape from a lot of these fights I, so, first off, props to Malavex and Fire Streaks. We talked about their bot lane dominance showing through in the early game. We saw it there, finding the duo kill. It really feels like Booyah relies on this bot lane to get advantages on their own, and so far they've delivered. And I love what Booyah's doing. I was about to say, I want to watch them, or see them rotate the Misfortune into the mid lane. Get the Yasuo and the Darius in the side lane like this team comp's supposed to do. Looks like they're rotating into the mid lane to try and fight this Infernal Drake comp. And, oh man, look at Yasuo. He's got two levels on this Quirky already. Really want to see Wimbles and Pots go to the side lane. I feel like if they do this now, um, they won't be able to shut down the Darius and the Yasuo. MF gets the scale in the mid lane. They farm three waves effectively. This is the point of the game that Booyah should be looking at Snowball, and they are. Love to see this coming out from their team. Yep, the aggression, the grouping. They said, hey, we'll even leave that Darius in the bottom lane solo, bring our ADC up to grab this Rift Herald. We can drop it in mid lane, execute this turret, head towards Drake that's up in 20 seconds if we want to, and be able to pick that up. Keep 
Glacial Rising from getting onto Soul Point, which is one of the very, very few things currently going for Glacial Rising is the fact they have been able to pick up those first two Drakes, so they have a little bit for them, and there's still that chance that Camille can hop over the wall and try to steal away this Ocean Drake, but it's fairly limited, and at the moment I think Glacial Rising is just going to oh, let boy. this Drake go over and try to I don't know, I think they mid. fight. Eh, maybe not. It looks like they're going to trade the Drake out for mid turn, which is a nice trade, getting that gold taking away that mid turret from this fortune that is going to uh, make the 131 a little bit harder to execute also while the drake went down um they did manage to crash a significant uh wave into the top point turret a double wave was missed out on the side of booyah so well played from them that said booyah does end up picking the drake and i do want to take note of the itemization coming through here uh, love the fact that the mordekaiser is picking up so much armor after that the andre's torment uh really feel like Glacial Rising Phoenix recognizes that the only AP damage sh shining through is going to be that Elise. If they stack armor, they should be able to tank these fights. And, you know, that gold lead uh, later in the game, even if it does say that Booyah Armada is in the lead, if they index armor, they're actually going to be very far ahead because there's no magic damage coming out on the side of Booyah. Yeah, because the Elise falls off, right? 25 yes. minutes into the game, the Elise becomes a cocoon bot. Her job is exactly, to get the lane yeah. super smashing early game, and then basically her job should be done. But at this point, Greasy God hasn't been able to actually get quite that far ahead. And when you look at overall gold between the two teams, there's only maybe a thousand gold difference between them. And both of those first turrets were in favor of Glacial Rising Phoenix, plus the two Drakes as well. So while you can say that Booyah has been able to win a lot of these skirmishes, they are 12 and 8 in overall kills, and maybe they've been able to grab those two Rift Heralds. The Drakes and these bigger objectives as those turrets going the way of Glacial Rising means that they're willing to just go toe for toe when it comes to trading these objectives. And in the bot lane, oh. Nubali, though, going to immediately go to the Death Realm, try to take down that Misfortune. She's there all by herself. Yama goes golden just to survive a little bit longer, but Wimbles should be able to finish her off with that Q. Nubali will get the trade one for one. Now run through the turret, flashing away as well. He it's just a one be for one trade overall. No, yeah, they're they want to keep going, though, from the side of Glacial. Hextech ultimatum using the killer instinct from the Kai'Sa as well, trying to take down Pots on the Yasuo. A couple of auto attacks. The, the, the uh, Kai at least though, chasing in onto Merkty. There's the Repel, but goes to a minion because Mordekaiser is here as well. Greasy God flashing away, has the Rift Herald, which there's not much time on that Rift Herald. If she goes down, might lose it from the Fountain as Greasy God will drop lower and lower. Obliterate comes out Wimbles from Mordekaiser, finishing Ooh. it off. The Darius is here, but not going to chase in any any further the rift herald up to about quarter left on its timer wimbles should be looking to try to make a play especially as nautilus is going to land He's that decimate bring in a oh, no. two members dredge line the darius is gone wow the damage coming out from skiz and the um ikathian rain from the kaisa takes down darius yeah and that's why we talked about darius getting ahead early right he needs gold to function because if he does join the team for these team fights he's vulnerable he doesn't have a lot of movement abilities to ensure that he gets on these carries there he walks into four members and just melts to the kaisa camille beautiful plays coming out from dynamite larry forcing on the yasuo in the mid lane and this is why we talk about putting this fortune mid right it should theoretically be the safest lane to farm but if yasuo is in the side lane they try and make that play well guess what the baron gets freed up and all of a sudden Booyah gets access to that. Instead, they put Yasuo mid. They make the play on him, and Booyah runs in one by one. Uncharacteristic of them uh, compared to what we've seen so far today. A uh, bit of a mishap, and all of a sudden, it's a 3k gold lead over to Glacial Rising Phoenix. And with the late game comp and the double 80 carries coming in, Corky's approaching Triforce. We have a Rage Void coming in for Kaisa pretty soon. They seem to have taken control of this game. Yeah, Glacial Rising Phoenix striking back and really kind of, I don't want to use the Phoenix uh, you know, figure a little bit too literally, but they definitely were the team that were a bit behind, and now they may be able to take a 2,000 gold lead, looking really, really good as they are setting up for potential control around this Baron. They're still on dr uh, one dragon away from being on that dragon soul point, as well as the main factor for me was that in the fights, they seemed a lot more controlled and a lot more focus on which their target selection was when they are grouped as five versus the early game skirmishes seemed a little bit more chaotic as everyone was just kind of throwing spells at whatever yeah. enemy happened to show up in front of them and and a lot of that because like they see more control because booyah kind of botched their lane assignments right for some reason past the 20 minute mark they had their bot lane 
bot still. They, you want them to be mid at all times. Get that mid farm over to the Misfortune. Put that Yasuo in the side lane where he excels, can get those 1v1s in the long lane. That said, he was mid. They managed to pick the members off of Booyah one by one, and now they have control as this Ocean Drake spawning. If they get this, they're on soul point, and so far they have map control, but Booyah just reset. They're getting back on the map. Fully expect for this to be a big fight. Players to watch in this fight. We have the Zonius Hourglass coming in for both Morgana and Mordecai. are significant items coming in. And we have the upgraded Manamune coming in from Corky with that Trinity Force. He is going to be doing so much damage in this team fight. So here we are. Round the Drake. Booyah Armada on the top side of the river. It's actually started off by Skiz. Poking a little bit of damage with that Gatling gun. Fire streaks in the front line. Looking for a dredge line on somebody. Mordekaiser hopping over the wall. Goes in alone. The Camille. Or sorry, the Elise. The Greasy God was able to grab that Ocean Drake for the side of Booyah Armada. In the meantime, Good the rest of the fight time. will continue. Greasy God going golden. Hextech ultimatum already started. The Darius taken down by Mordekaiser in the 1v1 inside the Death Realm. And now he's cleaning up the Misfortune as well. Forcing the flash from oh. Merc. He's right on their tail. Yasuo able to take down both the Corky and the Camille in the meantime. So he's chasing in a 3 for 3 for so far between the two teams. Ring Void Seeker's going to miss. Exactly. Ring around the Dragon Pit they go. Potts trying to take down Nubily, but he immediately dashes in. Whoa, takes down Murky as well. Can he find now the 2v1 versus Nubily's Mordekaiser? What? The damage output the Misfortune is doing, forcing Nubily to back away. And Booya Armada come out with both the Drake and the team fight victory. That fight was looking so bad for Booyah Armada, but Potts with the hero plays on this Yasuo picked up four of those kills, nearly had the Ana Pensa picking up Mordecai, so they're near the end. That They got the first two kills of the fight. Nubly altered the Darius, got him out of the fight, managed to win that 1v1, moved on to take down the Elise. The Nautilus fell after he blew off his spells and didn't have Aftershock, and they won a 2v5 off the back of Potts just going crazy on this Yasuo. Again, the target selection is absolutely critical. Not only is he able to take down both the Camille and the Corky that were gunning for him on the bottom side of the fight, but then afterwards says, look, I know you've already burned your ultimate. I have to dash you uh, outside of your claw, but other than that, you're not really going to mess with me, Mordekaiser, because you're so unbelievably slow. I can focus on taking down the Kaisa, and once your Kaisa goes down, you really don't have anything else left because you can't 1v2. And at that yeah. point, they won the fight. That said, the next fight, I've got to believe that this Mordekaiser is going to ult the Yasuo. He doesn't have a QSS yet. I feel like if they take Yasuo out of the fight, they should be able to run over the rest of the team just like they did there when they took the Darius out. Except it was Potts with the hero poise bringing his team back from the depths of destruction. Oh god, we got another oh, fight already. They're trying to go straight in, but bullet, bullet time. time from Misfortune across two members immediately into the death room. You said the Mordekaiser was going to take Yasuo there. Well, he's definitely taking him. That's the ultimate of the last breath. Get finding the knockup, but Mordekaiser's not dead just yet. Two claws as he goes down, but he's trying to save the Kaisa. She gets the Akathian Reign, but she's still going to fall. Booyah! Armada win the fight in the 4v4. And Potts is so much to deal with, but the big part was that he didn't have skiz in the fight. He's doing so much damage on this Corky, but he was in the side lane answering Wembles as he's going to pick up the Constellation kill here. Yep, it gets a little bit back, but unfortunately, when you don't have that major damage dealer, it means that you lose a lot of your ability to actually kill people. Mordekaiser surviving for a long time, but Camille, Dynamite, Larry, after finding some really good early game picks and an amazing Dragon Steel, just hasn't shown up in these last two fights, diving and then immediately dying to the Nautilus CC and Misfortune damage. Yeah, I really want Camille. Like, they have so many t uh, tools to deal with this Yasuo, right? They have the Mordekaiser ult, have the Camille. They need to figure out a way to take Yasuo down because Potts is doing so much work. Even in the Death Realm, when he came out of it, he managed to find the knockup, which allowed Malavex to pick up the last two kills, finding himself the triple, and that's so huge for this fortune. She picked up a B off sword off of that, is close to her Infinity Edge. She is still behind the itemization of the Kai'Sa, but if she's able to find that IE, she's going to be able to function in these fights. Uh, and man, we have ourselves such a close game on a knife's edge. Map control at the moment is with Glacial Rising Phoenix as they have control over the Big Purple Worm. But I'm really looking for Booyah to try and execute this one 
3 1. They still have pots in this mid lane. I really want to see them put pots in the side lane with the Darius on the bot side. Try and get the 1 3 1 going because pots is so strong. It's going to take two or three members to take them down right now. Well, they also know that they don't have to rush in for this fight around the Baron because the members of Glacial Rising, while they can take down that Baron, it's going to take a little bit of time. They don't have the most amount of damage to be able to burn it quickly unless Corky and Kaiser are both 100% focused on that Baron. And so they can kind of take their time, push in the wave a little bit, and scout out, dra grab a couple of wards, as well as go for Drake number potentially three for them up in 43 seconds. So they know that there's a bit of a pressure point around Drake, because whoever grabs this Drake will take the lead in overall Drakes. Uh, and this next fight could be a, a really tipping point for either of these teams. Yeah, and Soul Point, especially when it's Ocean Soul, is so powerful and crucial here. You got to think that these teams are going to brawl this one out as Ocean Drake is almost on the map. We have Yama towards the Baron sweeping out wards, maybe looking to pressure that. Are they going to try to start Baron when this Ocean Drake spawns? The oh, Wemble's got to shrink it down, so they're not in the dark on this, and there are no more pink wards in the inventories of Glacial Rising Phoenix, so I don't think they're going to be able to cheese this one, but they're still trying to pressure it. Mid prio though, going over to Booyah Armada should give them the Ocean Drake. I believe they should just put Yasuo down to solo it, except it looks like Mordecai is going to go do the same thing as they're trying to put the handcuffs here. Well, Booyah is kind of being run all over the map, right? They go to yeah, Drake, yeah. they're potentially trying to start it up as soon as it spawns. They fear that the Darius is all alone okay, and might go. be in trouble, so they run all the way up there. And now they've run all the way back to Drake to start it up again, but Camille is here. She can hop over the wall, try to steal this away. At least we'll grab it, so at least the dragon soul point for Booya Armada, but they lose their jungler in the process, so now they can't truly contest the 50-50 smite fight for the Baron, but they could still at least go for the fight if they want to, and Glacial Rising heads directly towards that Baron. This is huge. With the Mordekaiser all, they can turn this into a, a 3v4 uh, around the Baron. This should be the Baron going over with 280 carries. Mordekaiser needs to get in the pit and tank, because this Morgana just lost half her health part of the Baron. It's dying too fast. This is going to be the Purple Worm going over to Gl Glacial Rising Phoenix. Yeah, I think Booyah is said, you know what, it's a bit too dangerous to try to fight in the 5v4. Elise is still down for another several seconds, so let's just play it safe. We can turtle out through that Baron. So now that normally you're saying, hey, we have the Yasuo and the Darius for being in side lanes. We can 1-3-1 the rest of our team and shove out all of these waves. We look to crack some of these second tier turrets. With the Baron buff in the hands of Glacier Rising Phoenix, that goal is going to be a lot more difficult to achieve. Honestly, this shifts the game entirely to the side of Glacial Rising Phoenix. I know that Booyah Armada are on Soul Point for Ocean Soul, but they should be able to get these three inner turrets that are still up easily and start to pressure an inhibitor because the wave clear on the side of Booyah Armada is, is it's not good. Darius and Yasuo do not have good wave clear. It's up to the misfortune to beat down these Baron Creeps and going up against the Corky Kaisa. Double 80 carry comps. These, these structures should fall easily. Uh, so look for them to at least get one inhibitor here. I think that's a really good goal that Glacier Rising Phoenix should have with this Baron. And if they take down that inhibitor, that makes the Ocean Soul so much more difficult to capture on the side of Booyah because you're going to have that lane of super minions just pouring into your base if you don't manage it. Well, they are going to split up to push all three waves, which is going to waste a lot of Baron time. Now, waste being used loosely, because if your goal is to get all waves shoved into the second tier turrets and just pick up some of that extra standing gold that's around the map, then you would say, hey, that's not really a waste. But at the same time, if your goal was to, as you said, crack an inhibitor and really start to open up this game a little bit more and accelerate this game a little bit more, then it's not going to be the most effective at that. But I think they're willing to just grab as much gold as they can. They have been able to, within the last two fights, literally go from a 500 gold lead to a nearly 5,000 gold lead. So credit to Glacial Rising for being able to at least start to stack up some of this gold lead. And now they look to grab this bottom lane second tier turret. They will get it as Mordecai is just having a little 1v1 versus Darius in the top lane. He's doing pretty well on it too. And yeah, it, go ahead. they are applying Baron buffs to all three lanes. We even have the Misfortune bullet time coming out just to clear the wave. I like that choice coming out from Malavex as they're just trying to protect these structures. If they keep all their inhibitor turrets up, that's honestly a win going over to the side yeah. of Booyah Armada. Uh, you expect the inner turrets to fall when a Baron uh, goes over, but if they can keep these structures up, that's a huge win as they're looking at Ocean Soul. That's their win condition in their game, this game. They need to get one of the next two Drakes. 
4v4 in the bottom side. Noddle is stepping forward. Careful. Fire streaks trying to do a little bit of clearing with his E, but that turret oh. is dropping lower and lower. There's a cannon minion. Two, three more shots. Might be able to finish it off. Wimble's actually using the apprehend to pull the turret uh, minion, uh, cannon minion, excuse me, a little bit closer and finish it off. Saving the turret. Yeah, this is the last wave of Baron Creeps, and it looks like they're actually going to back off and take a blue buff. Kind of surprised they didn't go for that turret. Uh, with the last wave of Baron Creeps coming in, that's a win for Booyah Armada, keeping those structures up. Well played from them. Yeah, as you said, it, the win is simply to not get an inhibitor down. Because if an inhibitor goes down, that becomes a pressure point, especially with something like the bottom lane inhibitor, that the enemy team can then play around for the next Baron. So, yeah, losing the outer second tier turret, that hurts a little bit. That's a little bit more gold going to Glacial Rising Phoenix. But successfully being able to keep your inhibitors up is a big deal, especially at the 32-minute mark. We could not yeah. ask for a more intense game for our finals best of one because while on one hand it looks like Glacier Rising Phoenix they have the lead and they could potentially just scale this into a victory for Booyah Armada they bring a ton of crowd control between the Nautilus and they still always have that extra damage when it comes to the Darius ultimate that if a team fight just happens to slightly go sour for Glacier Rising Phoenix that Noxian guillotine just goes through executing members of Glacier Rising Phoenix oh potentially winning the fight for them and that could spell the end of the game because most these death timers are pushing 30 seconds so it is soul point for uh booyah armada but that said in between the last two fights we've had this corky has gotten so fed he's level 17 has completed that infinity edge i don't have time to talk we already have the fight breaking out yeah they grab the Mordekaiser. he immediately takes yasuo to the death realm but they're kind of waiting around for him to pop out pops is just wasting a whole bunch of time camille's jumping to the they back line the rappel coming out but the bullet time not gonna work because his fortune is already dead nautilus may be huge and maybe a tank but his carries are dying yasuo goes down darius goes down elise will fall the nautilus quick to go as well you talked about the damage from the corky it's enough to get the ace for glacierizing phoenix they're tp'ing in to push the minion wave in the bottom side 30 to 40 seconds and all the members of booyah are uh, that fight may have won Glacial the game. What a close game between these two teams, and it ended up coming down to Skiz having that stopwatch in his inventory. They tried to all in onto the Corky, but that stopwatch ended up saving his life from the Yasuo. With them not being able to take down the Corky when they focused all their damage, he ended up turning it around. A 5 for 0 team fight going over to Glacial Rising Phoenix, and a beautiful game played out from both of these teams, and a very close win going over to Glacial Rising Phoenix. Gonna take the first week of May here as, uh, man, what, I still can't get over how close that game was. On a knife's edge, it felt like for the entirety of the game, those teams going blow for blow with each other. What a great week one. Yeah, there were about three team fights at the very end. The first two going the way of Glacial Rising, though just a little bit. It wasn't that complete domination. It was a you know a four for a three or a, a three for two. Those sorts of you know just scuffles a little bit. A couple of members dying on each side, but that last one especially, you just hit the nail on the head when it came to Skiz. He didn't even have a Zonyas. It literally is just a stopwatch in his inventory, uh, keeping him alive through the initial burst of Booyah Armada. But I really think that one of the biggest factors was the fact that Misfortune was sitting in the Ocean Drake brush, you about to bullet time all four members of Glacial Rising Phoenix, or at least all three members that they could see, and Dynamite Larry wraps around the back of the Dragon Pit and drops everything onto the Misfortune, taking out Malavex, which then means you have three damage sources left. You have the Elise, who was repelled at the time because she was taking too much damage. You have Yasuo, who's in the Death Realm by the Mordekaiser, and you have the Darius left. Once the Darius goes down, because he's essentially 1v4 at that point, then the Elise comes down from the Repel, she dies, Yasuo comes out of the Death Realm, he dies, and it's just a buffet line of kills to Glacial Rising Phoenix, and they wrap up the game in such a nice, tight bow. Yeah, and, you know, we talked earlier about the game, like, they had tools to deal with the Yasuo, right? And we talked about the Death Realm from Mordekaiser and the Ultimate from Camille. And in that last fight, they finally figured out the right solution to that puzzle of how to use those tools correctly. Camille finding the misfortune, putting her in that cage and taking Yasuo out of the fight with that Death Realm was exactly what they needed. A dominant 5 for 0 team fight uh, and a very clean ending to an extremely close game between both of these teams. Uh, hope to see them go toe-to-toe -to -toe again in future weeks as that was an exciting match for the entirety of, of the game.
Yeah, beautiful, beautiful stuff. Well, huge congratulations to Glacial Rising Phoenix. They've been able to win our week one of our May series. And congratulations to them. They'll have the most points and get the immediate invitation into the May Invitational Tournament later on this month. Or next month, really, because we're still in April wrapping it up. But congratulations to this team. And a basic job from Booyah Armada trying very, very hard. Malvex is still an ADC to keep your eyes on in this bottom lane played a beautiful misfortune and while they had some unique picks with the Yasuo and Elise it may not have worked out this series but we'll keep our eyes on them next week when I'm sure they will come back for revenge yeah absolutely it's kind of the fun of having this monthly invitational you get to tell a story from the start to the end Great to see Glacier Rising Phoenix take Chapter 1, but I'm excited to see Chapter 2 between these two organizations. If we got, like, final after final of these two teams just, you know, smacking it together, that would be amazing. But the biggest deal is we also can't forget Toon Squad. Toon Squad is still around, and they may have gone down game 1, so we didn't get to see them in any of our future games. But they're still a dominant team to keep our eyes on as well. So we have a lot of teams vying for this first place again. And I, I love that just uh, competitive competitiveness coming out that we're seeing so beautiful beautiful stuff well i've been jake kelton joined by cubby thank you so much for coming in tonight cubby and casting it was an absolute absolute blast and appreciate it a lot yeah jake always a pleasure to cast with you i'm excited uh and hopefully do this more in the future too Yep, we will be back tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the Midweight Invitational Tournament. So if 